Hi, everyone. I'm Aparna, and I'm a product manager on the AI platform at Facebook. And I'm here with Lin Chow, uh, my colleague, to tell you a little bit about the ingredients that go into building a mobile AI platform at Facebook scale. Sorry, I'm having some clicker issues, looks like. Oh, sorry. Okay, there we go. Sorry. We're off to a great start here. <laughs> so, okay, in the next 30 minutes, which will hopefully go better than the first second, I'm gonna start by telling you how we're using AI and ML to power dozens of experiences at uh, Facebook today. The growing trend to move from server onto edge and mobile, and some of the trade-offs and challenges that go into building such a mobile AI platform. I'll then hand over to Lynn, who will then tell you more about the approaches that we're taking as Facebook to handle some of the challenges that I lay out. Now, there's no doubt that AI is mission critical to Facebook today. AI makes several of our existing products a lot better, so here is an example of natural language processing being used to make social recommendations a much more pleasant experience. So what happens here is the NLP algorithms look at every post, identify the intent in the post, extract the entities of the post, and then use all of that to create a better experience. AI is also used to break language barriers through our translation service. It turns out that over 50% of Facebook users have at least one friend whose native language is not English. And with the cutting edge research from our friends in Facebook AI research, we now power over 6 billion translations every day on Facebook. The last example I want to walk through is one of accessibility. This is breaking barriers of a different kind. So if you look at these examples, you have computer vision looking at every post and every image on the post to give you captions by identifying objects, actions, and scenes so your friends who may be visually impaired can get the same experience on Facebook as the others. Now, we have over 400 trillion predictions that we serve at Facebook every day. And this is to use AI to connect people to both other people as well as content that they care about in a meaningful way while keeping our community safe. So the sheer size of this and scale that we're talking about is somewhat unprecedented. So now the question is, why mobile? And before answering this, let's think a little bit about how these applications that I was talking about are actually powered. Now, a lot of these applications have really large speech or computer vision or natural language models running. And currently, these models are running somewhere in a server with a large amount of compute available to them. Now, as AI becomes more and more ubiquitous, there is a growing trend to try and move these models from the server onto devices such as a mobile phone or other embed embedded devices like the portal, for instance. Now, what are some reasons we might want to do this, right? The first one is latency. Now let's take an example like AR to power a video call on portal. Now here is an example where clearly as users we would agree that the round trip back and forth to the server to make every prediction really ruins the user experience. So latency is a big problem that we'd want to solve when we move ML and AI to mobile. The second one is one of privacy. And I think most of you must have heard Mark's keynote today. And, and basically what Mark motivated is that privacy and encryption are becoming the cornerstone for Facebook and the applications that we power moving forward. And getting ML and AI to run on device is critical to enabling this vision. We really want, we really want to be able to keep the communications, all the data, the models, the parameters, and all the artifacts, artifacts that come with it on the device without making these trips back and forth to the server. The last piece that I want to talk about to motivate why mobile is one of bandwidth. 
So here is a connectivity map that tells you that majority of our users are in areas with 2G or less bandwidth. And so what this means is that when you look at an application like this pose detection application, we really cannot enable this unless we have it running on device. And so these are the reasons why we think that getting AI and mobile to run on device is super critical for Facebook. Now next, let's move on to some of the challenges that we're posed with as we bring AI and ML onto our devices. I'll hit on three challenges. The first one is size, second is performance, and the third is developer experience. Now let's look at this wonderful AR uh, effect on this phone. Now let's think about where this started, right? So it was a large computer vision model. It's a large neural net with several layers, and we had to refine these layers and reduce the size of it and reduce the memory footprint to be able to bring that and serve it on the phone. Now this is not an easy task, and there's several amounts of active research going on in model compression, as well as various ways to look at reducing these models and bringing them onto mobile as well as other embedded devices. The second one I want to talk about is performance. And let's start with just the sheer scale that we have to talk about as Facebook. Now we serve over 1.5 billion people every day on Facebook, and we have neural networks running on more than 1 billion phones across the globe. Now in addition to this, we have a large amount of diversity in these devices. Over 72% of the devices are over six years old. So what does that actually mean? Looking at this chart, what we can see is that more than half of our users are using phones whose peak performance is 10x less than the phones that you and me use today. So in order to bring the same kind of experience to both our low-end users as well as the high-end ones, is actually quite a challenge. The last aspect of performance that I want to touch on is one of the extreme fragmentation in the mobile ecosystem today. So let's look at a couple of definitions first. So when we think about a mobile chipset, what we're talking about is CPUs, GPUs, memory controllers, as well as more and more neural net accelerators that are customized per architecture. And so, when you think about it, each one of these 20 plus chipset vendors has a customized set of components that we have to target every time we want to take a fancy algorithm and bring it onto the phone. Now just understanding this landscape itself is quite complex. And as an AI platform, what we'd like to do is abstract away all of this complexity from mobile AI app developers so that you can actually focus on enabling cool and new experiences for your users. Now the last aspect after size and performance that I want to talk about is one of developer productivity. So now let's refresh ourselves on what the usual ML pipeline looks like. So you start with a research idea, you prototype it, you get a model that looks fairly reasonable, and then you get a lot of data, you usually have to annotate this data, you transform that data into several features. You pass those features into a model. You need to train that model at scale, especially at Facebook scale. You tune the hyperparameters of that model. And finally, you're ready to deploy and serve. So what does this mean when we're actually talking about the mobile inference? You take this model. It could be your favorite deep learning PyTorch model. And then you have to go through a number of steps in order to serve it on device. The first one is to convert it, bringing it into the format for the target architecture that the vendor has. The second one is to optimize both for memory as well as uh, speed in order to make the experience the best that one can get on that target architecture. And finally, serve it to the billions of phones as well as the variety of de devices that I just described earlier. Now what happens today is that the time it takes to go from an idea to production is really long. And especially if you look at the blue boxes in the mobile inference area, these are highly iterative with lots of dependencies, very manual, and take a lot of time. So as a mobile AI platform, one of our goals is to try and automate this as much as possible. 
and really accelerate the time it takes to go from idea all the way to production on device. Now, in addition to this, as we create these models, we also want to have a continuous stream of analytics running. We want to have a continuous stream of benchmarks with all the models that are available and to be able to first find out how our models are doing, both with respect to performance as well as accuracy, and have the ability to share these models in the mobile community. Now, if you look at a lot of the applications in Facebook today, we're seeing more and more of a trend of these experiences moving from server onto production in mobile, as you can see over here. And as these are running, I'd like to welcome Lynn on stage to go under the hood and tell us about the technical ingredients to enable these. Thank you. My name's Lynn. I'm an engineer manager at Facebook AI Infrastructure. I'm going to share with us a great set of example how AI as technology empowered, enabled great Facebook product experience, as well as help us transition to be a privacy first company. She also called out one of the key problem and challenge we're facing today is how to quickly convert a research idea and deploy that in production and yield impact at the Facebook scale. If we step back, one of the key elements to enable fast research idea iteration is flexibility and ease of use. However, at the Facebook production setting, we really care about performance and at, uh, working at high scale. As of last f last year, we announced that we are unifying two framework into one called PyTorch 1.0. We have released, announced it last year, December. It is our unified framework to bring research and production together. And here, I'm gonna talk about a lot of technical ingredients to build out AI framework for mobile in the context of this framework we are developing right now. Today, I will share with you five core technical ingredients across machine learning kernel library, open source standardized API, machine learning compiler, quantization, and the streamlined developer experience. To the concern of Facebook, as our partner just shared with us, we really care about sending a extremely good product exp production experience to our user with 1.5, more than 1.5 billion daily active user covering more than 1 billion mobile devices. We cannot do that and build out an AI framework for mobile without working widely with our partners. Our partners covers across silicon vendors, various different operating systems, as well as a wide spectrum of mobile phone vendors. So I would like to share with you the mobile hardware landscape. We look at this landscape from multiple dimensions. One dimension, as we see on the y-axis, is how common a particular hardware backend is being used or deployed. On the x-axis, we show that how mature a particular mobile backend, the programmability, programming API is, as well as how power efficient it is. As you can see from this diagram, we look at four major hardware backends. On the left up corner, we have our CPU that is most of our uh, uh, used, adopted, with most mature programming API. And on the lower right corner, we have newer processing unit that is least adopted with least mature API, but is most power efficient. And the circle size uh, represent how fragmented it is within this particular hardware backend, right? And the newly developed hardware backend is more fragmented, and that's understandable. So based on this landscape, we will talk about a few technologies to target each segment of this landscape. First, we'll look at the most important hardware that is well adopted today, that is, as of now, we should focus on. And the st strategy we will use is to develop machine learning kernel libraries. 
to target towards those hardware backends. Machine learning kernel libraries are acceleration packet that is um, speed up neural network computation, such as matrix to matrix multiplication, convolution, so on and so forth. Typical technologies about um, used for machine learning kernel libraries are um, such as optimize for memory cache locality or um, minimize memory bandwidth consumption through operator fusion or using hardware specialized instructions such as CMD or vectorization. F at Facebook, we develop our own machine learning kernel libraries specially targeted at ARM CPU because that's mostly widely adopted and hardware backend on mobile phone. It's called QNM Pack, and QNM Pack has been deployed to Facebook production. We have also open sourced it, so it can benefit external developers. As you can see from this diagram, that through various different kind of benchmarking across seven different phones, the speed up of QNM Pack against the state of art is between 40% to more than 200%. Now we would like to switch and shift to look at different corner of the landscape. Those are DSP and MPU. These are the future hardware backends. Because those are emerging backends, it's less developed and it's very fragmented. Our current strategy is to leverage open source standardized API. So that will ease the pain of directly integrate with less mature program API and make things easier. In particular, I would like to share Android neural network program API. We are investigating how to leverage an API at Facebook. It has expanded operator support. Android Q is gonna support and allocate an API target towards specific hardware block in a chip. So here's the high level flow. Application can integrate with machine learning framework and library. Hardware vendors will register their driver of a specific hardware backend, such as DSP, specialized hardware, and GPU. If the hardware backend is not registered, and CPU is the fallback. Now I introduced two different technical strategy covered two extreme, two spectrum of this landscape. A natural question comes in as, can we achieve both performance and programmability at the same time? Machine learning compiler has been emerging technology that has drawn a lot of attention lately. And the goal of machine learning compiler is to be able to strike the balance between these two. Typically, machine learning compiler has three different layers. First, it takes a graph definition of a neural network, either use a set of rules or use a predefined search space to generate an optimized graph that usually has a better performance and semantically equivalent. The second step, it will optimize the operator. It will optimize the operator through loop transformation, thread binding, cache locality, and so on and so forth. And the last step is for the compiler to generate the best code towards specific hardware backend. Now I would like to walk you through the end-to-end -end flow of how machine learning compiler work at Facebook. First, our user will define their neural network through the PyTorch developer environment. And then that definition path through PyTorch JIT layer and create a graph representation. From that point on, that graph representation will integrate with various different compiler to lower the graph definition into optimized machine code. And there our strategy is widely uh, integrated with various different kind of compiler backends so that we can generate best code that we can deploy to Facebook data center setting or mobile and embedded setting. For example, we integrate the TVM for CPU, XLA for TPU, and GLOW for face of hardware accelerators, TensorRT for NVIDIA, and we also leverage TVM for mobile devices.
I just share with you three different techni techni ingredients that is purely optimized performance. There's another ingredient. It will strike a balance between performance and accuracy. It's called quantization. First, let me show you how different hardware native support various different position. As you can see, across server-side kind of hardware, CPU, GPU, and mobile G CPU, GPU, DSP, it has native support for various different degree of low precision computation. Varying from 64-bit floating point, 8-bit integer, and sometimes even for 4-bit integer computation. Quantization is actually a very simple idea to leverage low precision computation. The idea behind quantization is basically mapping from a high precision numeric representation to a low precision numeric representation, and then do the computation or matrix multiplication. In this particular example, we can map a 32-bit floating point into a 16-bit floating point, or 8-bit integer, or even binary. That way, it can significantly reduce the memory footprint of activation weights and significantly increase the computation capacity. However, as you can see, this will also drop accuracy because we low, use low precision representation of a number, therefore accuracy can be lossy. This is a performance study reported externally. Compare an unquantized neural net, a three unquantized neural net with quantized neural network. As you can see across these three results, there are more than 20% of performance improvement with quantized neural net. And we see similar kind of results internally as well. So now you may think quantization is a great performance tool. However, it is not easy to directly integrate quantization into our workflow. The reason is, as you can see, for each hardware backend, there could be one or two or three different machine learning kernel libraries supporting that hardware backend. For us to invoke quantization, different kernel libraries has to have corresponding quantized operator implemented. And as we build out our AI infra um, framework, we would like to hide that complexity from end user and let the framework handle all the quantized, quantized operator and integration with the underlying kernel libraries. Now I would like to show you what does the model quantization flow look like. Typically, we first train our model, and then we convert our model for inference. After that, we do graph optimization, and then deploy to production. And this workflow generates reasonable accuracy, but performance may not be ideal. A simple way to introduce quantization is after we train and convert model for inference, we just map an operator into a quantized operator. This is a very simple operation. So this approach can achieve good performance because we use low position for automatic computation. However, it loses accuracy. To address that problem, we usually insert an operator called fake quantization operator. That fake quantization operator is gonna simulate accuracy loss and retrain the model to compensate for that accuracy loss. And the rest flows stay the same. With this approach, we can achieve both accuracy and performance. Now I should just talk about four different technical ingredients for performance optimization. I'd like to squeeze your gear to address the challenge about developer productivity. As the partner just showed us, the end-to-end -end flow uh, from research to production, especially on mobile, is very complicated. In particular, converting a model post-training into a mobile-friendly model with the right size, optimized model for specific mobile hardware backend, and the deploy model to production is very manual and a complex process. We would like to build a lot of autom automation tool to ease the pain of this complexity in the manual work. In addition, 
we are building a benchmarking suite that we can pull the model you deposit in a model zoo or your model repository and automatically run various different kind of performance benchmark against a wide variety of hardware backends, such as CPU, GPU for server, mobile, or embedded devices. And then a report will automatically generate it to help you monitor performance regression, understand performance variation, debugging, and then you keep the performance iteration. As all these great technical ingredients I have introduced to you, many of those has been incorporated into PyTorch already, and some of those are still under development. Please stay tuned for more release announcement and the, uh, the blogs coming from PyTorch. Thank you so much for spending um, 30 minutes with us in this session. Um, tomorrow we have more sessions to do a lot more te um, PyTorch technical deep dive. Please join us tomorrow. And we'd like to continue this conversation more after F8. Uh, either you as a user of PyTorch or as a developer that can help us build out AI framework for mobile together and make it better. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. Sometimes it isn't.